Thank you for joining us today on the uh, Quantum Leap podcast. Not at all, entirely welcome. My pleasure. Could you tell me about your experience filming Quantum Leap, the four different episodes? Quantum Leap was probably one of my favorite shows to do, uh, partly because I was a huge fan of Dean Stockwell, and also because I adored watching Scott Bakula work. You know, he he just was so professional, and he was so good at what he did, and he just he was just extraordinary. And I I loved I loved being with them, and they they were such fun. I mean, Scott was very professional, and Dean was very funny. So we had we had great time on the shoots. It was I mean, Dean was always late. He always had his cigar. He was always saying, "What are we doing? Where are we? What what scene is it?" And and it just it, it relaxed everybody really because then the focus was on him and of course he knew exactly what he was doing so you know but it was it was just great fun I loved playing that character I loved Renee Coleman and uh, we we just had a great time and Belisario was really good to me on that shoot I mean he he had his moments but he on that shoot he left me alone I don't mean that. You know, I don't mean that in a salacious way. I mean, he just, you know, he could be very hands-on as a producer. And by then he trusted me, so he let me be. Did uh, the first episode of Quantum Leap you do help you get the role of Zoe later on? Um, I don't know. I, You know, I have no idea. Um, all I know is that that was the most uncomfortable scene I've ever shot, sitting in that water and being submerged and then having to come up. It was just it was just a horrendously uncomfortable, you know, episode. But um, I got on very well with Deborah Pratt, and we became sort of friends then, and I think that sort of helped a bit. I've no idea. I mean, I'd worked with Belisario before. I'd done a couple of Magnum PIs, and uh, I knew that he was saving me for something else. And so it was just, I mean, it was just really nice. I mean, you, you, you know, in those days... You met a producer and you created a relationship with them and then they would offer you stuff out of the blue, do you know? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of what happened and it was just really nice. I think it came more from what I did on Magnum than, than, than you know, from drowning, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were also a, kind yeah. of a scary ghost at the end there. I was, I was. I've taken several scary ghosts, really. I mean, evil is what I do, I'm known for, so... You know, evil, strong, powerful, domineering, all of those, and and or, and or murderers. Do you like playing uh, evil people? Of course. I mean, they're much more they're they're much more interesting to play, and and I've always loved them. I've always loved them, but I've played a lot of them in England. I used to play much nicer people, and when I got to the states, it turned into evil. Because Murder, She Wrote, I did four of those. I did a, I did three Father Dowlings, and, uh, you know, I mean, I that's all I did was kill people. <laughs> and get paid for it. And then Lacey, I mean, I just kill people. Or, or And then when I, when I went into the alien work, um, you know, I was just a, a leader. Interesting, huh? Do you get recognized more at conventions from uh, Star Trek or from Quantum Leap or something else? No, Star Trek. Always Star Trek. Always Star Trek. Uh, Tourette is one of their favorites, and then closely followed by Miraf to Yale, the scientist. But Tourette is their favorite. I like Tourette, too. I thought she was really good. I loved Miraf to Yale. That was uh, really good in the episode First Contact of Next Generation. Really good character. It uh, sticks in your mind. Was Is that more like you than... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't know. I'm not sure my children might disagree with you, but I'd like to think that I was more like Miraf than I am Commander Tourette. But... Uh, it was, I, those, they, were, they were fascinating things to do. I mean, you know, on one hand, it was just a job, and I was really lucky, and they called me back four times. But on the other hand, it was always fascinating to do, because at the time, when, when I did it, I had no idea that it was going to turn into this sort of thing afterwards, these, the, you know, the conventions and all of that. I had no idea. Was the makeup work hard to do? Was that difficult, being in makeup? makeup the makeup work was an absolute sod. You know, you, I got there at three thirty in the morning, ready to shoot by seven thirty. It was hell. And the first time I went in for the, because they had to make a mask. So the first time I went in and I got the complete face mask put on, I was doing it with a guy who was going to be an extra. And as soon as they covered him up and put the straws up his nose and in his mouth, he lasted about thirty seconds when he was gone. He just couldn't take it. But they were horrible, horrible, horrible things to wear. They're just no fun. And by the end of the week, you've just got this ring of, you know, because I was allergic to the glue that they put on. And as Marasta Yale, they made me a special pair of sort of fish flippers, you know, hands that were like mittens. 
I knew yeah. that it was just a pain in the butt. I just didn't know what to do with these things. And the scenes always, they let you wait around with all this stuff on, and then suddenly they say, ready in five, and then you knew you were going to work for about eight hours. So they came, they said, ready in five. I said, okay, have to go to the loo. Zoomed off to go to the bathroom. And as I turned around, knocked one of these things into the loo. <laughs> one of these fish finger things into the loo. And I sat there staring at this thing floating about. I thought, what do I do? I didn't know if I could wash it. I didn't know how to, I mean, I, I didn't know what to do with the thing. So I very gingerly put it under water. And it immediately absorbed all the water that was in the basin. So it was now this really revolting thing that I admit and I had to put back on my hand. And I used it a lot in the scene. So it was just it was, and, ugh, it was just awful. So I, I eventually got it wrung out and dried off and then went in there and said I'd lost them. And so then they tied them both onto me with a piece of string like a child going to school. <laughs> and these stupid things right around me. But anyway, and they weren't going to make me another one because they, they were very difficult to make and they had so many to make with all that stuff that ears were put on. I had maybe three pairs of ears and they were put on separately and I had one pair of these mittens for Marasta and I had three masks for and that was that was it. So I had to. They would take. They took three and a half hours to put on every morning, and they took an hour and a half to take off every night. So I got there at three thirty. I was on the set by seven thirty, wrapped at ten thirty, and back at three thirty. So was it a relief when you got to do your Voyager episodes where you didn't have the prosthetic makeup? Well, the Voyager thing was a whole other case. That was a whole. That was there were massive problems with her too. Um, well, she took a long time, too, because the wig and all of that sort of stuff, and, and you know, the, the hideous harridan, as I used to call it. And I did that shoot with septicemia. I had been bitten by a cat down to the bone, and I didn't want it to not do the job, so I thought I'd just quietly not mention to them. You know, I, I didn't, I'd already done the Friday shoot. I was coming in to finish her off on the Monday. So I thought, and I got bitten on the Saturday, and I knew I was in trouble because it blew up and I had blood poisoning. So I went to the hospital and said, listen, I've got the shoot, so just fix me up until uh, Tuesday. I'll be in on Tuesday morning. <laughs> I mean, I was insane. So I got to Paramount, and... My arm was all puffy, and I was wearing that stupid outfit. So I just said quietly to somebody, listen, you know, on the cube, just keep me filled up with painkillers because I've got this blood poisoning thing, and I just and I need to, I just want to finish this shoot, and I, I've told them I'll be back on Tuesday. Well, they absolutely freaked. I mean, it was just naive of me to think I could get away with it. And they all freaked, and they told the director, they told the producer, and the next thing I was marched off half-dressed in my Victorian gear, to the emergency room at Cedar sinai which is the big hospital in L.A. And I get towed in there into the emergency. I'm wearing the wig with all the lace uh, stuff. I have that strange makeup on. I've got a Victorian petticoat and all of that stuff on. And I'm walking through the emergency room, and there's two guys who've just been in a knife fight, and they're lying on stretchers just bleeding everywhere. And they look at me as I walk past, and their eyes get absolutely enormous, and they just say, we've died, we've died, we've died. And they really thought I was something out of another life that had just walked past them. You know, and it, was, it must have been the most weird thing, seeing me in, in costume going in, in the emergency room. I don't know, maybe they're used to it because it's Hollywood, but it was, it was big fun for me. You would think they would see that all the time. Well, you'd think so, but I don't think they do, because normally most people get, you know, I went to the emergency because it was blood poisoning, but I think most of it, the, 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 the doctors go to the, to the studios. That storyline of the hollow novel that you were in on Voyager, it never really got resolved. Was there any plans to bring you back for another episode? Oh, yeah, they thought this would be an arc that would go on through the series. But every so often, this is, you know, because it was basically Mrs. Dampers. Um, that they thought that I would come back. And, and they told me that at the beginning. They said, listen, this is your chance, because you're going to be probably in three or four, maybe five of these episodes. And the writers just couldn't make an interesting enough story out of it for it to be continued. That was basically all that happened. So they dropped it. They didn't like it up there, upstairs, you know? I liked it. I, I was always looking forward to seeing how it ended, but... Well, I know. We, I mean, yeah, I know. Kate and I had all sorts of ideas about it because cause it could have been really interesting, but they did, they just didn't want to pursue it. And I, I don't think that they were, you know, well, I don't know. I don't know if I knew enough about, about 
the classics, you know, because there was there was all sorts of fun ways it could go. Anyway, they didn't. So that. Other than uh, the Star Trek and Quantum Leap, do you have any favorite projects that you did or that people seem to enjoy that you were in? I know you've done so much, but uh, is there anything that like really sticks out as your favorite? There was so much of it because you know television is such a strange medium that it's very difficult to lose yourself in it. You know, as an actor, I mean, and I've done a lot of theater and I've done a lot of good movies. You know, and I don't have a special one because each one. I don't. I don't have a special one. I have some horrible ones I'd rather not have done, but I, I which I don't, don't even talk about. But the ones that I did that people know me for, I always had a good time. The people made it's so much easier to work well when you're surrounded by good actors, and it's as simple as that. You know, the Cagney and Laces I did. I loved both those women. They were just extraordinary and became great friends. In Patrick Stewart was a joy, as was, I mean, everybody on Star Trek was a joy. I loved, I, I, you know, that's all I can say. I love doing theater. I've done a lot of that. And it's the company that allows you to go to different heights. Bad television breeds bad performances. Good stories, good acting. It's a very boring answer to your question. <laughs> no, that was good. That was good. With the advent of Netflix and people watching older television shows, do you get new generations coming up to you that recognize you from uh, shows you did earlier in your career? Well, there are some people that do. I mean, you know, and on this side of the globe, what's happening is that people know me very well for a ghastly movie that I did that I hated called Steptoe and Son. <laughs> that, that was the original Sanford and Son, right? That was the, the yeah, the precursor to Sanford and Son. And, and I did the only movie. And and I hated it. I hated. I mean, I loved. I loved Wilfred, but I hated the rest of it. And it ended up being a very uncomfortable shoot for me. But it's it's incredibly popular. And and I was in a cab about six months ago. I was in London, and I hadn't been back for thirty five years, really, not for any length of time. And I was in this cab, and I was going off somewhere, and the cabbie kept looking at me and smiling. And he said, why are you smiling? And I said, well, it's so bizarre to be back here after 30 years tooling around in a cab. And he said, why, where have you been? And I said, well, Los Angeles. And he said, yeah, huh, I knew that. And I said, how did you know that? He said, because I know who you are. I said, what do you mean? He said, you did a movie called Steptoe and Son, didn't you? And I said, yes. And he said, that's one of my favorite movies. So bizarre to be recognized. I mean, he didn't know anything else I'd done. He didn't know me from in the, the, the Star Trek or any of that. He remembered me from Steptoe. I mean, I did Steptoe in 1972 or 70. That's a long time ago. And I was born. So that was uh, sort of interesting. People know me here for Survivors, which is also a television series. Right. That's big on Netflix right now, too. Is it big? I think so. Uh, I see a lot of people talking about it. So it's, it's on my queue. I'm going to check it out. Well, no, it's a very, it's a really interesting, I think it holds up. So if you can get by the accents, I think it really holds up. Oh, I love uh, British television, so. <laughs> well, we're doing, funnily enough, um, the three of us that did the first series are all getting together to do another, a radio, an audio show, an audio series of Survivors. Oh, wow. And we're doing it for a company called Big Finish here in, in England. So we're also at the moment doing a lot of Doctor Who. I love Doctor Who. Well, they're doing Doctor Who with Colin, and, I, and I've done one of them as an alien, so I'm going back to do another. And then they said, you know, we're going to do a series with, with all the original guys of Survivors. I think that's a great idea. So uh, that's one of my projects coming up this year. That's amazing. You, you've been doing a lot of voice work lately um, for video games also, and uh, you're one of the few people that have done Star Trek and Star Wars because you've done the Star Wars video games. Um, I have. I know. <laughs> I've never thought of it like that. <laughs> you, you and Doctor Who, you've been in everything, really. The, all the iconic big sci-fi things. I know, isn't that cool? It's it's amazing. I love it. I love it. It's so cool. I do. I really do. I really do. I'm but now. I went to Cardiff to do a convention, and we we got a whole bunch of, of stuff together. And of the photographs that went most of all, it was uh, Mass Effect, the Doctor in Mass Effect. The Cardiff University were there, and, and that's the one that they recognize me for, and they really, they, they love that character. Do you enjoy doing the voice work? It's such hard work. I love it. I love it because it's a chance to act, you know, in, in, in your comfy clothes. But it is such hard work. 
and it, you really you really know that you've worked hard when you when you've done one of those shows to work with just a, a microphone and to make it come alive and know that the people are going to write this old character and the creature that it's going to be I mean you then luckily they give you a guideline of the character you know they give you a, a diagram of what she's going to look like and then then you go from there so it's it's incredibly hard work because you have nobody to act off so it's it's great fun. I love it, but I'm always exhausted. And also because there's always a lot of dying in it. So one's <laughs> screaming and you're, you know. I mean, the last one, always the last one, Gears of War. Um, Mira, the, we went through one afternoon where Chris called Mira and he said, we're going to do, this is going to be hell, so you've got to really have your voice warmed up. So I'm singing and warming up my voice in the car going over there. People thought I was nuts, and I get in there, and he's got like 60 pages of, of Mira, the logo screen, dying. And he said, all right, so we're going to start with this one. And this is when you get cut in half with an electric, with a, with a, with a, with a saber, you know, a, a, a laser saber. This is where you get burned. This is where you get blown up. This is where, you, and there were all these different ways that I had to die. I literally, I couldn't talk for about two days. <laughs> And it's, it's exhausting. It's exhausting using that much energy and having to remember that you can't go off mic, that you've got to keep it in focus. You've got to remember where... It's, just, it's crazy. It's crazy, but I love it. One, you know, I lose pounds doing that. You just sweat buckets in that studio. It's great fun. Going back to Quantum Leap, did you find a, a different playing a hologram versus a leaper? No, because there is no difference. The truth is there. You you, you play the, the you play the person. You know, she doesn't know she's a hologram. She doesn't care if she's a hologram. I mean, the only element that might have come into it is that she could have more fun. But I mean, really, she just as far as she was concerned, I guess she just thought she was real. We have a question from Hayden. Yeah. Miss Stoltz was a ghost and disappeared once her body was found. Zoe and Aaliyah are implied to be dead and sent by the devil to undo Sam's work. Do you think it was intended that Mrs. Stoltz and Zoe are the same character and that Zoe was recruited because of her previous altercation with Sam, or do you see them as entirely separate characters? Well, this person has spent a lot of time thinking about it. <laughs> um, what a good question. Do you know, I, I mean, I've never, ever considered it, so I don't, I, I can only, because I've never really thought about it, I would have to say that it was, that, that, but it was two separate characters. But maybe that's what Don said. He never brought that up to me. But maybe that's exactly what it was. But what a brilliant concept. Thank you for whoever that was. Brilliant. That was uh, Hayden. Hayden, well, thank you. Well done. You have such a such a great voice. Uh, I think that's why people recognize you no matter how many prosthetics you wear is partly, you know, of course you're acting, but the voice is amazing. I think it is too. My voice has got me into lots of trouble. And also lots of joy. It's worked out well. It was. It did not start off like this, Albert. It was a very different voice. It was very high. I had a very high voice, and I went to drama school. And the, probably the, the paramount voice teacher in the world, a woman called Sis Berry, who is extraordinary and stands among well, maybe not the world, she's probably amongst five. But she taught me voice, and I used to talk like the Queen. And I have no nerve yet to stop. I talked exactly like that, as you will see when you watch Survivors. And she came up to me, and she just punched me in the diaphragm one day. And if you get punched in the diaphragm, and you let out the air, your voice goes, oh. <laughs> And she said to me, I never, ever, ever want to hear your voice go higher than that. And that's where my voice was trying to keep it down there. Um, and now it's completely natural. And I didn't have a range before, so I was in, it was incapable of working for me because that's my tool. And if I don't use it properly, you know, I let it down. And she enabled me to see how far I could go with it. That's why voice work is such a joy now because I really practice with it. It's always learning. I never get it right. <laughs> never get it right, no matter how many takes. I never get it right. I maybe, I've maybe gotten it right twice in a 40-year career. Wow. Always driving. Do you have any little anecdotes or stories that happened while filming Quantum Leap the listeners might want to hear? I don't. I mean, that's the awful thing is I don't. I mean, I you know, it's been a long time. And, you know, I, I don't because there just wasn't time for anything too funny to happen. I'm sure Scott has some things 
to talk about, but there was nothing horrible happened on that show. It was very tightly organized, very tightly run, and there just wasn't time. You know, Scott was professional and just had a bead on, on, on... He knew everything about everyone on that shoot. He knew... He knew every, and he also knew everybody. He knew he knew everybody's names. He wasn't. He was just divine and professional and gentle and kind, but so well rehearsed and so on the ball every single day. I've never known a man work so hard. And the opposite end of that was Dean, who didn't work so hard. <laughs> and Dean was the one who had the jokes, and Dean was the one with that saucy cigar that I loathed. And and he and I were the naughty couple on the set. I mean, we you know we were the ones that created sort of you know if there was any problem or we weren't ready, we'd kick off in the middle of a take or something. It was the and I. But I don't have any sort of real anecdotes because there just wasn't time for them. It was a very professional shoot. Well, that's good to know. It's good to know that you enjoyed your time, though. I did. I loved it. I loved it. Was it difficult with all the special effects they had to do with the leaping and the morphing? Did you have to do spend extra time like standing still, and was that difficult? Um. No, that in itself wasn't difficult. What was difficult was remembering where you were when you when it turned around. You know what I mean? Um, that, that, thank God for that continuity girl who really, you know, continuity guy. I mean, you know, they both of them worked really, really hard. You no, know, it just was confusing because the, the, you know they'd say you've morphed now and boom, and you were somewhere else, and so it was sort of it was sort of weird, but it wasn't difficult. I didn't have to do anything special. Special effects, they do it all. Thank you so much for talking with us today. I really appreciate it. That was lovely. It was lovely. You're very welcome, Arthur.